Dana, they did not even bother to introduce themselves. She only realized who they were when they brought her to the security services of Ukraine Odessa office. So they did take her to their office. Yes, tell me, they acted as kidnappers, not saying who they were, presenting no identification, attacking a young lady. She's 30, is she not? Yes, she is. Are they always like that? We cannot talk of legality in Ukraine now. During the interrogation, they insisted that she was working for Russia's federal security service. So, infiltration on Moscow's part then? Yes. Why were they so many? To make it more intimidating. You mean to make it clear what can happen to activists and those interested in the actual numbers of casualties of those killed in the Odessa fire? Well, yes, that is the way they go about threatening people now. The police and the security services of Ukraine shared addresses and phone numbers of Kulikova field activists on the internet. So they pointed out those whom the right sector had to deal with, those who survived the massacre and the fire in Odessa. The new head of the Regional Department of Internal Affairs, by the way, he's a graduate of the US-run International Law Enforcement Academy in Budapest, admitted that he had given the lists to right sector activists. They're not even trying to conceal it. Activists say that on the same night, one of the Kulikova field activists included on the list was stabbed to death. We're now talking about Ulyana Sayanovskaya. She was extremely lucky to survive. She was beaten brutally, but later pushed outside. After the fire in the trade union's house, they did not dare to go on torturing her and instead let her go. I'll reiterate, they had no detention order, no right to sanction. They do whatever they want. Intimidation is their main aim. Insane, insane, Insane. I think a world leader should step in and stop this insanity. It would not necessarily have to be a politician. I do understand that, but here's what I don't understand. If in Mariupol, from any high place they can find, just like in a prison, they can shoot down defenseless people, why bother to bring in the planes and fighter jets? It's because they're fascists. Is that your explanation? There's no other way to explain it. They are nothing but fascists. Let me tell you what happened to me personally. The police sent me a search warrant for my house. It is in Ukrainian, though, but it states clearly that they will seize, that's underlined, Second World War symbols, including St. George ribbons. Why? Really, why? These people are fascists, real fascists. Do they have an issue with St. George ribbons and 1941-45 to 45 heroism? Evidently, they also want to seize the clothes in which those misdeeds were committed. So the warrant says, word for word. They refer to the Soviet army setting Kiev and Ukraine free from fascist invaders as a misdeed. Yes, I have this written in the decision by the Donetsk court. Naturally, I was not present in court. So, fascism, Babi Yar, execution by shooting and in gas chambers were all good deeds. Is that how the Ukrainian court sees it now? Yes. Insane. I can imagine this shown in a film, court decision in the name of the Ukrainian Republic, seize all Soviet military uniforms. Our guest's grandfather defended Kiev from fascists, seize military uniform and natural decorations including St. George ribbons. Disgraceful. Just disgraceful. How is it possible? We're not going to label it good or bad because it's quite clear. But how can it be possible? Yevgeny Yevtushenko composed poems about Babi Yar and mass shootings, not only of Jews near Kiev, by the way, possibly his best poems by far. I agree. Here in lime now thrown, clobber resting upon stone, halfway past death being halfway killed, only to have their graves half filled. See, old women shedding a tear, and their dignified Abrahams see their children crying with fear, much like the infants of Bethlehem. Speak, there are no words to express, pieces of plate in the roadside mud, bits of a talith and wisps of a talmud, papers all torn which none shall possess. Yevtushenko is our last chance to get a Nobel Prize in literature our very last one. Black is the cross at the Calvary Hill, dread is the place, 
and dead is the will. This is a brilliant and moving poem. The fascists are going about their business, peeling rags from the suffering and piling up the spoils. A girl on the bottom, flecked by the dirt. Oh, my eyes, they hurt. Hear a boy's voice, them implore. Do the socks have to come off? Oh, and then he stopped to embrace his mother just once more. Yevtushenko is about to be barred from Ukraine, and the Ukrainian SS division are about to become the new national heroes. That is why people started protesting in the southeast at first. We cannot accept Bandera and the SS Galician division as our new heroes. That's just not possible. Not in the country that drove fascists out of Ukraine. Ukrainians also fought against fascists, just like other Soviet nations did. They were all against them. Today's situation just does not make sense. We're facing strange times. War brings out foolishness in the masses. The court orders the seizure of St. George's ribbons. The court? Exactly. Why? Well, that is what they are. The court is represented by people rather than papers, by people and judges brimming with nationalist designs. There are lots of people like that in Ukraine at the moment. Security services are provided with lists of addresses, of activists, of active activists, of the ringleaders who brought 10 to 20 people with them. Are you talking about the so-called targeted raids? Yes. Pavel Salavyov, born 1992. Mikhail Labiednik, born in 1960. Nikolai Shevchenko, born 68. Judging by their last names, these are not only Russian-speaking people among them, but also Ukrainian and Jews. Well, yes, Ukrainians too. Igor Yoroshenko, born in 1978. Vasily Kovalenko, born in 1945. Nikolai Milyukov, born in 1986, former deputy head of the Pechorsky District Office of Internal Affairs. Is he also missing? Yes, he disappeared without trace. He left his home and never came back. Back. That is a result of targeted raids. We came out to fight fascists occupying the center in Kiev, yes? We had no weapons or even sticks. Why not? Your opponents were armed. We were determined to act legally and using weapons is illegal. We did not even have any protection equipment. It was a peaceful protest. We wanted to point out that our rights were being infringed, and those people would come out against us, armed with pipes, reinforcing bars, clubs and shields. Each of them had an axe hidden behind their shield. They had holstered firearms, guns attached to their belts. What did they need axes for if they were armed? To be more brutal, I guess. They made clubs by welding several reinforcing bars together and welding nails onto them. That is what they used against us. Kiev policemen were standing and watching instead of interfering. Similar things happened in Yugoslavia. Why shall we interfere? It's a civil matter, said the policemen in Kiev. A civil matter. Can you imagine that? Andre, they are hunting people, true. In Odessa too, not just in Kiev. I take care of refugees. There are young children among them. They are hunting children of people whose only fault was to say what they thought. They never shot anybody. Did they flee from Odessa to Moscow to you? Yes. They beat us, cracked our heads and broke our ribs. The worst part was, they also attacked women and children, not just men. Who attacked you? Well, they had arm patches of the Ukrainian insurgent army, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, and the Ukrainian people's self-defense. So they weren't trying to conceal their involvement with the right sector. No, they were wearing masks. They were about 300 people, I guess. And you? About 150. What do you think? Were they waiting for you? Sure. They also beat women. Yes, they did. There were also some teenagers among us. Why did you bring women and kids with you? It was a peaceful protest. You had no idea that you were going to be attacked? No, we did not. Why would you take women and children with you even to a peaceful protest when you didn't know how it could end up? They wanted to come. 
People participating in an absolutely peaceful demonstration do not expect to be attacked. They still do not want to believe it. No, I'm sure in Odessa they did not think about what happened in Mariupol. Wait, what had happened in Zaporozhye earlier, before the Mariupol violence on Palm Sunday? We sent an official request to the government, but there has been no answer. Palm Sunday was on the 13th of April. On that day, the traditional polite rally was held by the people of Zaporozhye. We do it traditionally as a polite request to observe our rights. The rally was surrounded by 2,000 armed militants from the right sector and the Maidan self-defense forces. Fast. Yes, armed with baseball bats, crowbars, non-lethal weapons and hatchets. How many were there? More than 2,000 for sure. 2,500 people attacked a thousand strong rally. There were a thousand rally participants, mostly women, kids, elders and the like. They were made to kneel and hand over their St. George ribbons. They were just walking and carrying Russian flags, right? Yes, the rally participants refused to comply, so the thugs started hitting them with baseball bats and crowbars, pouring acid over them. Many activists had the skin peeling off their hands and arms where they had tried to protect themselves. Did the thugs bring muriatic acid with them? I don't know exactly what kind of acid it was. They had burns on their skin. Were children also attacked? No, no children or women, thank God. Was taking them away alone? Well, the police turned up after a couple of hours. They formed a cordon. The opponents had no prolonged direct contact. The police did not break the thugs up, did they? They never even touched them. On the next day, the Zaporozhye chief police officer said, if a person carries a baseball bat in Zaporozhye, it cannot be considered as an infringement of the law. A deputy sent an official request, and according to the law that is still in effect in Ukraine, investigation agencies and the police are obliged to respond to illegal activity. The response might take a lot of time, so they started pouring acid on activists. They used tear gas while the police were there, and they threw fireworks. How many male activists were still there surrounded by militants? About 300. Yes, some of them had their heads cracked. 48 people were in injured and 28 admitted to hospital. Eight hours later, bishops came and helped them out of the mess. What if the bishops had not come? The activists would have been killed. It was getting dark, and the darker it was, the more brutal the fight became. Besides that, those monsters, sorry, I can't find another word for them, did not even let us evacuate the wounded. They punctured ambulance tires. Later, a prisoner transport vehicle came with a protective metal exterior to evacuate 10 people. Once they were locked inside that, the militants blocked the doors and took torched the vehicle. The guys inside were burning alive. Luckily, they managed to break the doors open and jump out, coughing from the carbon monoxide and with their skin scorched. If they hadn't been able to break down the doors, they would have been burnt to death. Absolutely. This is nothing but fascism as it is. People getting kidnapped, tortured and killed. Remember what happened in Berdyansk. A man was kidnapped there because he opposed the reign of violence. His name is Viktor Koloyanov. He was kept in a garage for over five days, tortured, injected with drugs, his leg was shot, and then he was finally let out. Even the junta-appointed Zaporozhye region prosecutor, Berdyansk belongs to the Zaporozhye region, acknowledged that. They crippled him, killing him slowly over five days and demanding that he renounce his ideas. No one saw it coming anyway. Protesters in Mariupol did not associate themselves with what had happened in Zaporozhye. Who could have imagined that fascists would be turning up everywhere in a country that had once fought against fascism? Andrei. There is a theory applied in practice and inspired by Bandera and his close friends, Sietska and Shakhevich. According to the theory, Moscows, as they refer to Moscovites, are to be frightened to death with unimaginable cruelty. I get it. I'm talking about something completely different. A person went missing in Berdyansk. This place is quite far away from Kiev, let me remind you, in Ukraine, in total, 600 people went missing. Some say, OK, that happened in a small place. Though Berdyansk is not really that small. But how can similar things be possible in Kiev, with all the branches of major European and US newspapers and CNN there? In Kiev, blood is spilt and people are attacked, just like in Zaporozhye. How can the Western media be missing something which is going on right in front of them? Yuri Studenberg was severely injured. One of his ribs was broken and his head was split open in two places. It had to be stitched up. What do you mean by split open? What was he attacked with? He's got a stab wound, so it must be a crowbar or a pipe. The cuts are wide, about 10 to 12 centimeters. Sergei Rudenko, a 15-year-old boy, was also beaten severely. His nose was broken and his head was split open too. How do they dare attack children? 
Can you explain that? They do not care who they are attacking. There were seven or eight people up against one guy with clubs, crowbars and pipes. Just him alone? Yes, they beat and kicked him. His mother was there, yelling like mad and pleading with them to leave him alone. She was on her knees. Did they listen to her? No. They attacked her too. They started beating her. She had her teeth knocked out. Then they started following other people who were trying to escape and knocked the hell out of them too. In what way? Some people were hiding in a supermarket. The fascists ran inside, broke shelves and attacked them, right inside. They knocked them to the floor and hit them with pipes, clubs and crowbars. There was a lot of blood. What about the police? There were no law enforcement officers around, no police at all. Despite the bloodshed in the center of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, a developed European city. I'm talking about something else. For several years, they used to shout from the rooftops about the death of a single journalist, Gongadze. Georgi Gongadze? Yes. Today, the same people can't be bothered to speak out about the deaths of hundreds of people. Gongadze's death had to be extensively discussed. Exactly. But those discussions paid off at the time. President Kuchma was accused of having discarded Gongadze. That single death led to a political crisis and a new government. Magnitsky Magnitsky's death in Russia resulted in the Magnitsky Act. Yes, he did die in prison, and what they did to him was inhuman. His death, the death of a single man, was a point of discussion throughout the world. Yes, I think that the biased and one-sided position of the West is changing gradually. To my surprise, CNN took the step of announcing recently that the Donetsk administrative building had been bombed by the Ukrainian Air Force. However, they did not show the bombs hitting the kindergarten. Still, it is already enough. The CNN journalists were punished because they went straight off the script dictated to them. The global community is informed of the Ukrainian crisis only from the official point of view fed to them by mass media. How did they explain the Odessa violence of 2nd of May? In the very same way, like peaceful militants were attacked by the crowd. The demonstration was headed up by alcoholics and the homeless throwing beer cans and swearing at them. Those were followed by armed gangsters and the whole thing was being run by the Russian special forces. The only one hole in their theory was...